Hi, this is Steve Hargadon. Is that you, Niru? You're not disconnected. Yes, it is. Oh, I'm... Oh, good. I'm okay. Welcome, I... everyone. Welcome, Niru. Don't start Thank yet. I'll, I'll get us going here. This is Steve Hargadon, and it is Wednesday, July 14th, 2010, and welcome to the Future of Education. Our guest tonight is Niru Kosla. Niru, thanks so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me. You're getting some clapping there. People are excited, I'm sure. Future of Education is sponsored by Learn Central. It's part of a program I run for Illuminate, my employer. Uh, we are appreciative of Illuminate supporting me in doing the series, and we hope you'll come join LearnCentral.org. It is a free network, a social network for educators that includes the use of Illuminate for free. We've announced our Global Education Conference for November, and even though Illuminate has been acquired by Blackboard, this is the big news of the last week, we have full permission to move ahead on this program, so uh, everything is still in, in go mode. November 15th to the 19th, 2010. Uh, this is multiple time zones, multiple languages, multiple tracks, and for free. This should be really, really fun, a huge response to this, so we're really looking forward to it. If you are interested in future events, we've got lots coming up. Uh, tomorrow night, Graham Glass is going to talk to us about uh, EDU 2.0. Uh, next week, James Bach on Secrets of a Buccaneer Scholar. It's a book I picked up in a bookstore and emailed him, and I'm delighted he's going to come on. Uh, Lawrence Peters on Global Education later in the month. Lots more fun there. I hope you'll join us for, for one or more of those. If you've missed the session, the recordings are all up on the website. Uh, last week we had uh, Heidi Hayes Jacobs on Curriculum 21 and then Ted Coldery on Teachers as Partners. Both great sessions, well worth listening to. They are up and uh, the recorded versions are up for you at futureofeducation.com. If this is your first time in Illuminate, it is a participative environment. You're in the newest version of Illuminate tonight and so things may look slightly different but not a whole lot. Uh, we'll give some different chances to uh, play around, but uh, you'll see that um, uh, at the bottom of the participant area, you can clap as uh, someone was just doing there. You've got the smiley face also. You can do a confused look or a thumbs down. We don't see those very often. The big hand with the green up arrow is how you'd raise your hand to ask a question. And if you think you'd like to ask a question later through the microphone, which we'd love you to do, it is worth going up to Tools, Audio, and running the Audio Setup Wizard to make sure your microphone is working. The other thing I recommend is to go to View Layouts and select the Wide Layout. The Wide Layout seems to do a better job for uh, watching the chat and keeping track of things. Okay, so we're going to give you your first chance to participate here. To the left of the map, you should now see some icons for participating, one of which is a wand with a red dot at the end, a laser pointer. And if you click on that and click on the map, you can let us know where you're listening from. You can also shout out in the chat. Looks like New Zealand, a couple in Canada. I'm, I am in Orlando, Florida today. And it is thunderstorm weather, but I haven't seen any any lightning yet. Well, we're sure glad to have you here tonight. And Niru, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you again for inviting me. This is actually very exciting to see technology make life easy for everyone. I can be in Palo Alto and you in Florida and we can have a conversation. Can you have uh, me? You know, I just love this technology. I'm, yep. It, there's a slight lag with the telephone bridge in the session, so you, you'll notice a, a second or two will go by between uh, my comments and yours. Okay. So why don't you give us a little bit of uh, your background? Uh, and then talk a little bit about CK12, and then when you would like, you can start advancing the slides through your show before we go to questions. Okay. Um, 
prime, you know, my first and most important uh, role or what I consider the most meaningful thing that I've done in my life is to be a mother. Uh, actually, uh, I see that my oldest is on uh, as one of the participants. Um, she's in New York, so it's 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 you know it's great. So being a, a mother, I you know the thing. I, I actually, I had in my previous life before I was a mother, I was a molecular biologist. I was doing research at Stanford, and uh, got pregnant with my oldest and realized that um, you know radioactive elements in pregnancy don't go together. And that's really when I got into um, education because I believe that's the most important thing you can give your children other than you know um, other than uh, a very safe environment, happy home and all that stuff. So from there I, I started looking at what is happening in the education arena and uh, my kids managed to get a really good education which was actually very personalized and customizable and it wasn't uh, based on standards and uh, such. So when they started going to high school I started wondering what I was going to do next and it was then I went back at the age of 50 I went back to school affairs at Stanford and realize there are things that need to be done in education. Um, and there are certain things that were holding kids back. And the number one, um, uh, holding them back in terms of, you can define all that, you know, interest, passion, wanting to learn, uh, being um, individual learners, or, or, you know, this whole, uh, you know, latching on to all those other things other than education, uh, science, math, Whatever you you like to call you know important in education. So at that time, um, I looked at green, some of the reasons, and the, I said, which ones can be controlled? And at that point, I came to the conclusion that one of the things that we haven't done much on is innovate in education. In the last 20, 30 years, there hasn't been innovation in technology. We're still using textbooks, which control the way we educate students. Um, you know, there's a catch-22, publishers say, we're required by the states to produce the content the way we do. And the state says that we can't afford to get the content uh, updated more often. And, you know, I'm sure everyone here has thought about textbook and their limitations. I'm not going to go into that, but really, um, that's what brought me to this. Uh, being in the middle of uh, Silicon Valley, I said, there's got to be somebody who can do something about this situation. And that's where I collected, uh, with my co-founder, Morgan Tal, um, collected the team, uh, you know, a stark, very committed uh, team to do this project. So, so when did you start? We started in 2000. Uh, 7 January. So it's it's a pretty new initiative. We're a very very young organization, um, and today we, you know, I I I I'll get to where we are today in a little while. Um, so it's just, I'm going to go to the uh, let me go to the uh, you know the my slides. Or unless you have some other questions you want to get to before the slides? No, I have lots of questions, but I'd like if it's good for you, I'd like you to go to the slides. And do you know how to do that? You click on that single arrow to go to the right? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I am. I'm actually I hope you guys can see the first slide. Secret twelve. So I think you're I think Secret you're still on Rome. Nero, I think you're still on that Rome. Do you have that oh, Rome I'm box sorry. checked? So uncheck that box yes. and then go again. Okay. So here we are. Can you see the? Yeah, I think you you should be able to see the first slide mark CK12 future of it. Okay, great. Um, just a little bit of Mark Twain. You know, 
education is all about passion. It has to be about passion, about what you want to learn about, you know, what pe- children, um, you know, that that's how they, they're uh, born and into this world with some kind of, um, you know, passion about things. They they want they reach out even as a baby things that attract them, and then we take them into school and educate them in a way that turns them off. I've seen students come into pre-K, uh, you know, reading very high level, and I'm being a little flippant by saying that they come, uh, you know, come up with uh, reading Charles Dickens or playing high, you know, high level of music or whatever that might be. So somehow all that gets turned off at time. I'm sorry, the next uh, slide is a little bit garbled because um, it was an interactive slide. But really what it talks about is that CK-12 was founded to take care of the rigidness of the textbook and trying to take the textbook into the next uh, you know, into the next innovation phase. I think textbooks have been around. They're important. Um, I, I see uh, Steve is also saying that this part of the story is being more accepted now. But when we started in 2007, people were just looking at us and not really understanding what we were talking about. So the textbook, I said, has become from a rigid and um, you know, how to update, te- you know, uh, technology or a container to, uh, we wanted to produce flex books that were, you know, you could customize and you could uh, also update as you needed. So, you know, all the weight. Now, we were also thinking about all the students that, you know, we were trying to educate in, in the system. If you look at, um, the, the study by, and I just use this one as an example. There are many, many more that kind of speak the same same thing, which is that uh, this is by Kaiser Family Foundation, that this generation between 8 and 80 years old spend a lot of time uh, on technology, whether it's television, whether it's music, whether it's computers, you know, you name it. This, this is what this generation has grown up with. Yet, you know, what we are trying to teach them uh, is through the old way. Um, you know, they, this generation really only spends about average of 0.38 hours in a day on books. They're actually spending everything else on, on technology. Very few of them really read, and I, I know that this is something all of you have already, already heard many times and have come to ex- ex- accept this. Um, you know, accept this phenomena. So it was at that time we were asking, why is it that we are not producing content, we are not producing an uh, education system that's more geared towards what, um, you know, people want to, how people want to learn. So taking this in consideration, we also looked at institutions and, we, you know, the schools and, and uh, uh, schools and districts and the states, and you know, one of the things, what were the things that were holding back uh, people from actually taking these leaps that we were hoping people would take? You know, cost is a huge issue. Cost and the time that a teacher has, those are two things that kind of hold teachers back. You know, they, they really don't, teachers don't really want to be told one more time, hey, uh, we are the um, you know, you know, you don't know how to do your job. Let me show you um, how to do it. That's something I saw over and over again uh, during my time at Stanford. Uh, there were all kind of things people were telling the teachers. You guys just don't know how to teach. Let me show you how to teach. But truly, it is truly the teacher that knows the student in the classroom, whether they're good teachers or, or you know not experienced teachers. Those teachers, when they end up spending time with the, te- uh, with the students in the classroom, get to know the students. Um, so, you know, what happens is one of the things that, they, they, that institutions aren't doing is to take the students from where they are 
and take them to the point we want them to get to. Everybody starts off with where everyone expects a student to be at, whether it's grade level, standard levels, state requirements, you know, you name it. But reality is it's a huge leap. There's no scaffolding for these students to get to where they need to get to uh, from where they are. And in general, you see a lot of the students are, you know, very behind. So there hasn't been an opportunity or, or a way uh, uh, okay, uh, Steve, I don't know how to do this. Um, can we turn off the audio alarm that plays every time someone enters? You know, I don't know how to do that. And what's interesting is I'm not getting an audio alarm. I'm just seeing it. But while you keep talking, I'm going to try and figure it out. Okay, so I, I, I don't hear it either. Uh, so I think some other people don't hear it. Hi, Brian. Um, so maybe Bruce needs to turn it off on his own computer. Um, so, anyways, back to uh, this, you know, issues at schools. I'm just speaking about few issues. There are many, many more. One of the other uh, issues that I noticed when I actually started getting fascinated uh, by education is uh, through this teacher. Uh, she was my uh, oldest daughter, Nina's teacher in the first grade. And this teacher was phenomenal. She's been she teaching for 28 years. She knew every student, every student, how they did what, who they interacted with, what were their passions, where were they, what did she need to do uh, to get them uh, to learn something. So she had this mounds and mounds of folders on these students. Unfortunately, uh, this is an extreme case, but she uh, passed away. She she was suffering from um, cancer. So, um, so what's happened is that uh, all the information that she collected over time, and all the wonderful programs that she instituted, all went away with her. And I think. That's becoming um, uh, that, that's a huge issue for institutions. So how do you um, institutionalize or keep memory uh, that goes away every time teachers, you know, leave? So um, and I'm actually reading this question. So excuse me for this. So let me just quickly go through this um, slide so then we, I can get to some of the questions. So we were, we are trying to create flexbooks that, because today teachers and students are used to uh, textbooks, we said, okay, we can provide a textbook that you are able uh, to that you are familiar with, and also we can give you um, textbooks that you can you can print print only what you need because. Not every student, we recognize that not every student actually has a computer. And we are actually um, trying to make sure we don't leave any of the students behind. In Palo Alto, Palo Alto itself is, you know, children sleep with uh, iPads and um, computers in their bed and wake up with those next to them every morning. East Palo Alto students turn out and, you know, they don't even have computers in their classroom. So there is, you know, digital divide. Divide. There isn't that, you know, it's getting better. But um, now we are actually. So we said we would create the same stuff that people were used to, but also we would online give you these things. We'll give you an online reader, which we actually, if you go to our website, you know, you can actually take use that online reader. It's updatable. It's open. Anybody can use our content online. Uh, or printers and pay for it themselves. We can't afford to pay for it, by the way. It is everything that we do is customized to state standard. We started with California standard because I recognize that K-12 education is very regulated. It isn't, you know, something. There is something to, to be said about regulation because you just can't have kids understanding place value or acceleration. Uh, before you understand velocity, motion velocity, or uh, you know, uh, understand place value to do multiplication, division, and all that stuff. So, 
keeping that uh, keeping that in mind, we kept uh, you know everything standardized to uh, customs. Uh, sorry, state standards customized to state standards. Um, we also you know in these textbooks give teachers lesson plans plans that are customized to whatever teachers need to do. We actually also provide teachers editions. In our teachers editions, we provide um, that uh, with our teachers editions, um, we provide them things like so. Excuse me. Wikitext is uh, not the same as connections. Uh, among uh, these are these are Wikitexts are basically based on this a question on the chat room. Uh, I want to clear that up. But in any case, so we in the, uh, the the emphasis of the teachers editions is um, you know misconceptions and understandings of the students, uh, differentiations, assessment, uh, different uh, ways of modalities of te teaching. So we we taken a little bit of different uh, approach to approach to these teachers editions. So. Excuse me. So we can actually take these and we can actually customize these with, for the students so that if a student is behind, we can actually slow the progression so that they start understanding this content much better than if you were um, uh, you know if you were a faster student. So we have student editions in August all all the books that were approved by the um, Ryan Bridges C Learn are um, are going to be available in, in, in two versions. They'll be at grade level, or they'll be either enriched, uh, or they, I'm sorry, Excel in, in enrichment, or they'll have, they'll be at um, remedial level. But by the end of the year, all three versions will be available for all the books. In fact, there are schools uh, that are actually already creating. Uh, these versions for their own population, so that uh, as they're creating those books, they will be uh, available on our website come September, uh, come August. Um, one of the things that you know people talk about is customizations to different learning styles. There are certain things that you know children can understand when they see it visually. You know, there's no way that you could. Uh, provide in the textbook the, all the multimedia elements that you can 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 very easily support on a living book online. You can you know have multimedia illustration, animation, videos, anything you know that that helps students to understand. So be be in our textbook in in real time in real space. Provide you these um, I should call them textbooks. Sorry. Uh, we, you know, provide all these elements. In fact, every summer we uh, have interns from high schools coming in here, or, or early college level, come in and work on these kind of elements. Right now, we have about 20 students that are working on creating videos and multimedia animations to particular, um, you know, particular elements. As, and it's really wonderful because they create. This content for their, you know, their peers. Um, in addition, I think one of the things that you know has been a really tough situation for, um, you know, uh, this, you know, students who are who have some sort of disability. You know they can't. If you can't hear or you can't see properly, these these textbooks are really hard for them to use. So we very easily can provide all kind of um, assist for students with disability. We can give them different modalities to learn. Uh, we in, uh, at the same time in this in the, during this. Um, uh, this summer, we are actually creating for our textbooks teaching modules that teachers who are, um, you know, videos of these 
teaching teachers teaching uh, particular topics. And again, some of this work is being done uh, with the students, you know, helping out. They they're videotaping the students, they're editing the videos. So you know, this is students are very much a part of all this um, work. You can, like I've already mentioned, that you can dynamically adjust content. We actually provide an editor with a symbol editor where you can change the math formula in these textbooks so that students who's behind can actually get a, a easier dose of that same concept, yet staying within the state requirements. Um, I keep trying to use my keyboard, sorry. And in addition to all that, of course, this is all free. So I hope I've given a good overview of CK12. This is really what we want to do, create a passionate learning uh, and bring back a lot of, you know, bring back education. So that's really my uh, presentation. I think that's a great so, overview. I have some questions, and no doubt some in the audience have questions as well. Yes. Go ahead, Niru. Yes, go ahead. Okay, so um, I, I'm really curious because it feels as though you're you're having to make decisions that um, match with current political realities. So one of the one of the mentions in the chat was the need for um, vetted authors in order for administrators to feel comfortable with the material. Is that was that a comment by Karen reflective of a process you've actually gone through a thought process of trying to make sure that these would be accepted? You know, okay. So let me talk to two things. One is the the, the way we uh, the production of these textbooks. And the, the second one, second one is the acceptance itself, right? So we took, we started. When we started, we knew we had to make sure that this content was uh, contextualized, that it was true, that it was, you know, meets all the requirements. It meets the reading levels. It meets, you know, all those kind of requirements. We, we went, we did follow a process exactly like publishers do. Only difference is we actually used um, we used teachers to create this content. Teachers who had been around for over five years, we contracted them. Initially, we did was we took California standards, created a flow of chapters, and from those flows, we said, okay, what is your strength? You know, to a teacher, what what's your strong subject or topic? So we would ask that teacher to, and these teachers were selected through a process, um, and they all came from, you know, uh, from the, uh, you know, uh, the math uh, societies or the uh, science societies, AAAS kind of uh, places. That's where we advertised. And each of these teachers wrote a chapter, which was then. Iterated with the, with the the author and a domain expert again selected for their experience, and we went back and forth and iterated on those on that process till we got to where we wanted to. And after that was done, we went through editing. We did high, um, you know, high in um, high quality images, and. We actually created the book. After the book was created, we had technical editing, regular editing, you know, all that stuff that the book the publishers do. But after that, we actually also sent these books out to uh, other teachers to give us reviews back. A form of, uh, we created a form that was very much like what the publishers do. But our process was so condensed. That in three and a half years we've actually created high school science and math uh, content as well as middle school science and math con content. Um, so the quality, and you know, we are trying to keep. We keep, we can easily iterate our quant quality. We can make sure the facts are right. Um, 
the state, I think California has taken one of the, you know, um, California has taken a huge forward step with the initiative for free uh, open, you know, textbooks. One of the things we also, when we were going through this initiative that uh, California went through, one of the problems we had was how do we ensure that other people don't change these um, open educational resources? Uh, open source booth is all about um, software. The, the terminology for content is uh, open educational resources. And this is really what flexbooks are. They are open, um, uh, open educational OER. So you can take any of our flexbook. You can change it. You can do what you want. But we are required to make sure that the original is not changed. And at this point, we don't really allow people to um, take our textbooks and share it with others, than you know, uh, share it with the rest of the world, only because we are trying to come up with a process. Um, that would help in ensuring that whatever is presented is of good quality and is correct, technically correct, or speaks to the right thing. Um, so these, these, these flexbooks have been on the recommended list. If you go to the CLearn site, clrn.org, um, you can get uh, how the process happened, um, and what are the criteria. Um, you can go and download this book from us. They're on our website. Our website has the next versions of those. They still follow the same standards, but they are available on our website as the next iteration, which you know means that we've improved it you know, from what we learned since the last um, Okay. Jump back in here for just a second. Um, so, what's the? Uh, I understand the motivation, and and I think you're you're getting hearty applause here from this group. Um, what's the financial model to sustain the effort? Uh, to be honest with you, right now. It is supported by a private foundation, and I, I, you know, what what when we started, we wanted to we wanted to see do a proof of concept because nothing had been done. We hadn't developed any software. No one had developed the software we did. We didn't have any content. We couldn't go to the publishers or any other copyrighted, you know, content. And take it because you know copyrighted. You cannot mix and match copyrighted content. We could do stuff from Wikipedia. We could actually create our own content. It's taken us, you know, this, all this while uh, to create. In the three and a half years we've been around, we've created the software. We are on to our 1.2 version. We're now working on our next version. That's a 2.0, and it's going to have a lot more functionality. We're trying to create a lot of automation. Trust me, it's really hard for a group of, you know, five to ten programmers to cre create all that functionality. And they've really gone. They've been super. They've been heroes for education. Um, so it, it has taken us this all this time to be where we are, but we're not done. We'll continue creating stuff so that it only gets better. We are trying to now our our Trojan horse or the end result is really to create um, um, modular content so that kids can you know given the the kind of world they live in, they don't have to have um, you know very large amount of content like you do in web you know in textbooks. By the way, I asked many teachers, have you ever uh, finished a book? I don't think I came across in the last three and a half years more than two teachers who said to me that they've actually finished the book. What's the adoption been like? Who's, who is welcoming this? Who's 
providing resistance. Well, I'll tell you a little story. So when we first started, about a year and a half, um, we had we were approached by uh, Governor Kim from Virginia and uh, Anish Chopra, who was the CTO for Virginia at that time, who's now the CTO for Obama. And they had done a study with NASA for two years, and they had found that all the physics books that they had, uh, they, the, the high school students were using stopped at cathode ray tube. Now, we all know that the world has moved, moved on beyond cathode ray tube. It's LCDs and nanotechnologies and you name it. You know, our kids were not learning any of that stuff in high school. Now, how do you expect teaching, you know, these kids to have any passion for stuff that's old? Then if you start teaching them about what's reality in their own world, you know, only then can you get any interest for one. And you know, Anish and um, Governor Kane went to the publishers and they were told it would take them about three to five years to produce this book, a contemporary physics book, and it would uh, cost them tens of millions of dollars. Well, Anish somehow found us about, about us and he came to me and said, would you help us write this book? And we said, yes. Governor Kane wrote for uh, RFBP from professors and teachers in, in physics. Twelve people came forward. Within three and a half months, we had the first iteration of that book. It was free. Completely. No one, there was not a money, any money spent other than our, us you know, in making that happen. But we actually then said, okay, we are going to open this book up, put it up on the website for a week, and we would like to review back. I'm told that the DOE looked through that book, or VOE, I should say, uh, looked through that book to find any mistakes. So also, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, a mindset issue. You know, how do you take innovation and accept innovation? It's always a slow process. People who are entrenched in the way we do things, it's really hard for them to change quickly or all of a sudden. You know, even first publishers didn't think we could do uh, this. Uh, this is all crap. In the end, you know, they, they're now starting to talk about modulizing the content, making it available. Um, you know, as a synchronous activity rather than, you know, one video is somewhere else and, you know, one pub problem set is somewhere else. Now everyone's talking about containing, uh, creating modular content that's actually contained with all the different modalities. So, you know, politics, uh, policy, uh, mindset, those are the time kind of things that are really holding us back. But we are seeing a lot of early adopters coming forward who are very keen and, and love to adopt the stuff for their own students. Is this the kind of technology where as publishing companies face you know, kind of tremendous pressures to reconfigure um, themselves that you could actually license to publishing companies as a way of um, generating a revenue stream for the project? You know, you you you've hit the nail on the head. You know, it, it is true. This this is what I keep saying, guys. I'm happy to work with anybody who wants to work with you know us. No one's come forward yet, but I think it's it's just a matter of time. We're happy to license it to anybody who wants it. Test stories. I don't know if my audio cut out there. I think this is going to be one of the great sort of case studies in the huge transformations of the web. It seems the financial interests here are really high. It seems like you have uh, real questions of adoption, and you've got uh, you know sort of a game-changing way of thinking about uh, teaching and learning. And and what you're doing is very much going to impact how we think about how 
how these changes would take place. Um, I'm going to jump really quickly. We've got a couple more minutes before we go to the the, the audience Q&A, but I, I want to jump quickly as kind of an interest of mine. So uh, the, okay. one of the early stories I heard about this kind of a process was uh, in Brazil where the textbooks were being written by the university students for the um, pre-university work, which seemed to me to kind of brilliantly capture this this ability for both teaching and learning, that, that the medium became a highly um, contributory or participative medium as well as a consumption medium. Uh, and, and, and in hearing you describe what's taking place, I know there's some student involvement, but it, it tends to be limited to the group who are creating the vetted material. Can you see in a larger vision a, a, a way in which this could become more participatory, not just in the consumption of the material, but also in the production? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, really, that is the end game, right? Um, it is about sharing your knowledge. I mean, look at the success Wikipedia has had. That's all participatory, you know, whether you're doing content writing or you're, or you are, um, you know, you're creating um, in a view process, you know, all that can happen to even content. You know, how much content do we really need? You know, we have the content online. What we need to do is kind of create one place where you know you could be the. And I've heard Anish Chopra talk talk about this, where um, we would have a central place where you could have all kind of content, but you can take that and and have people. Create their own, you know, context to that stuff. Really, the only thing, one of the things that changes in content is cultural application and and um, the application of that generation. Like you and I were grew up in a very different, um, you know, environment than our kids have grown up. So if you could take the same content and create the context for whether you are. A uh, soccer playing kid or a baseball playing kid, so you can understand how to, you know, get the parameter of a baseball field or a soccer field or anything that you have context to. You know, that that's really what in the end will have to happen. Not about one person um, creating everything for for everyone else. Right now, each textbook is created by one person. So this. This concept of uh, people getting together and um, uh, creating their own, own content is going to have to be the way to go in the future. That's what I'm hoping it will go. My favorite story in that regard, and it may just be because I've only seen a few stories, is uh, Carl Blythe at Texas, who has the upper language, upper level language students at um, University of Texas, I think it is create the material for the first year mm -hmm. students, knowing that the material is not going to be perfect, but the engagement that they get seeing the upper level students actually speaking a foreign language in a foreign country is so much more compelling and that they know that they will at some yeah. future time be creating material for the other early learners, to me kind of touches on the, the, the brilliance of that, of that model. Okay, so I do want to open up yes. to Q and A from Actually, the general group because I know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Can I, Steve? Can I, Steve? Can I just add to that? Uh, the the school that I actually sent my kids to um, had this um, this structure that first and second grade would be together, third and fourth would be together, and, and the idea behind that was that students would act as teachers. For the younger ones in the same class, and that really is a very powerful model as well. By the way, went through multi-age classes, and and we loved it, uh, and and believe very strongly in it. Um, okay, so uh, I've got obviously I've got way more questions than the time would allow, and it's not fair for me to monopolize the time. So we are now going to let you and the audience ask questions. Uh, you can do so either by 
putting them in the chat, or you can raise your hand using the hand with the green up arrow at the bottom of the participant window. If you raise your hand, we'll give you the mic and let you ask your question. Um, there are some questions that have come through already. Niru, and I don't know if you've seen any of them, but one was a question about the size of your organization. Um, yeah, it's actually those chat room questions have been dis dis distracting me. But yes, so our, our, uh, our organization is not very big. We're about now we're probably closing, uh, we're getting up to 25 people. We, half of them are developers, half of them are content people. But we have about, at this point, probably 100 contracted teachers who are creating the content. And so we do have a lot of contractors uh, creating this work, helping us create this work. OK, so any questions for Niru? If if you have a question, you can put it in the chat. I know if some have been in there. And, and uh, Karen is, has been good at answering questions. Does Karen actually work for CK12? No, I don't know who Karen is. Sorry. Well, Karen, whoever you are, we appreciate your being responsive there in the chat. So do you want to kind of, in the absence of any other specific questions, do you want to kind of give us a vision of, in the best case scenario, you know, what role you think CK12 plays in this transformation? And, and, and again, sort of painting the rosiest picture, how, how would things go? Well, you know, it's a very complex situation. I mean, CK12 comes at uh, with the philosophy that we like content, I think content needs to be free, particularly for K-12 kids. Little kids, young kids, young students need to have access to content. Right now, the content is so expensive that most kids are not able to have access to it. California has the Williams Act, which says every kid, by law, has to have a um, you don't have to have a textbook to take home. And so that that's a little bit of complexity. This is why we are, you know, have provided some print um, versions as well. But in the end, you know, the, uh, politically, uh, societally, we need to make sure there are, you know, jobs for people. So this is where the, it has to still continue to be a free market. I, I think at least, I see CK12 as a um, real viable option for people who don't necessarily want to pay and, and uh, would rather pay for something else. Maybe take that money, California, spending 600 million, Texas spending 600 million on a year on textbooks, can use that money somewhere else, pay teachers. So in, in the big so picture, um, Go ahead. It, I, it seems to me that, a, that um, I'm going to wait for you. Okay, thank you. So in the big picture, I'm hoping that we help move, uh, you know, content into a free uh, space. So it seems to me that you play a, an interesting role. Maybe in some ways there's a parallel with the open source community or the open source software community, which is that oftentimes uh, the open source software plays a dual role of both providing a valued alternative but also kind of goading the commercial companies into changing their strategies and providing things at a better cost and more effectively. And I can see a CK12 doing both of those things. Actually, it is happening. I mean, one of the things, because we are, you know, we are small, and um, because we are not, you know, we don't have to answer to anyone. We can innovate, and we can show, lead the way, so that publishers can actually think about, or, or not just publishers, but other people can think about how, you know, how to innovate in the space. I think education needs innovation 
very badly. So at this at this juncture, if if innovation becomes part of the you know equation, it will help us get the students. It will help us to do our job uh, much better than without innovation. And I'm hoping you know people seeing the innovation. And and I've seen I've been in meetings with publishers now, and I'm am seeing a lot more um, you know. Um, Response from publishers about innovation. So it's coming. What are some other organizations or projects that you're watching in this space that you feel are um, worth looking at? Uh, so there are there are for K twelve. Uh, there are a, a whole bunch of uh, projects, but the different uh, emphasis. Um, there is um, uh, NROC, which N R O C, um, and he provides just you know uh, snippets of information rather than textbook kind of um, you know kind of. Uh, in context, you know, a curriculum, complete curriculum kind of material. Uh, there is Curriki, which is again, you have, you can go in and uh, find different uh, kind of uh, things that uh, you can use, a teacher can use in the classroom. Again, you have to find it and figure out where it fits in. Um, there is a, um, so, and there is also um, there's also uh, uh, better lesson plans coming up, and uh, that's about just lesson plans. Um, yeah, yeah. Somebody, Karen just uh, said NROC is focused on online courses. Yes, you're right. It is focused on online courses. Um, so there isn't that much other than this. Uh, there's some stuff for high school from MIT. Uh, that you can find out from their um, open courseware work. Um, Carnegie Mellon has uh, some work on. Uh, they they have good stuff online, so you can find some stuff on Carnegie website. The open courseware. I don't know what they call. I forget the name of that program. If somebody knows it, put it in the chat, please. So you've mentioned your um, children in, uh, on, on the show. Um, you don't have to give any revealing information, but um, do you have more than one child? How old? Oh, I have four kids. Um, I have three girls. Uh, the three girls in the span they're between twenty two and a half and seventeen. My youngest is uh, going to be a senior. The other three are all at Stanford at this point. And and how do they feel about the work, and what kind of feedback do you get from them? Oh, they are tough. Mother, your sight stinks. Mother, you know, um, they're always telling me how to do it, and that's good. Since I have four children almost the same ages, I'm laughing very hard right now. <laughs> so you know what that's about. Yes, you know, I would well. love if there are any if there are any teachers or you know districts to kind of take a look at our website, take a look at our content. New New York School of One is using our content for middle school math. Um, Utah, we're doing a pilot study with uh, 12 district di districts that are looking, creating the content from our textbooks for their content context. And Brigham Young is doing a study on on, on our content and how it compares with textbooks. Uh, we're doing that. We're going to start that in Florida. We're doing this uh, work here in California. I'd love for other people to. Um, you know, come forward to us, and we'd love to test and you know pilot these things in, in um, their schools. We provide this 
content on on the Kindle, on you know, through EPUB, on iPod, um, and on netbooks. So if I have a Kindle app on my Android phone, can I actually access this content? Um, I don't know yet. I don't know whether you can on the... I guess you could if you have a Kindle app on your... Uh, but it's not available right now. Uh, as Today you can't do it, but then uh, by uh, August, because you're working with this um, uh, school district in uh, Florida, you're going to be able, uh, you know, talk to Amazon and have it for you to use in August. So it seems to but me you that you might find. Sorry for the delay. I didn't mean to talk over you there. Karen saying you can't access through PDF, and I think you were agreeing. It yes. seems to me you might find a pretty ready audience with the chartered school movement. Have you had any contact there at a at a broader level? It was our belief that it would be simpler uh, to do it through charter schools, but. The charter schools aren't as restrictive as the public schools, and that you know I don't I believe in doing the tough thing rather than the easy thing. But you know whenever charter schools have come forward, we've actually worked with them. And remember, we, this has just been a year now since we've been around. This is going to be really our first year, uh, a full year that's coming up. Do you have? Funding support that you feel could keep you going for a considerable period of time. Yes. Yes. And in your work in Utah, are you working with David Wiley at all? Yes, absolutely. We're working with David Wiley. He's the one who's leading the study. And. Uh, um, He's a great guy. He he's uh, working through Brigham Young University to great, you know create, to get Utah to agree to this study, and the state has agreed. So this is going to be quite a um, good study. We'll find out one way or the other. But the thing is, either way, if we're great, that's great. If we're not, we can actually improve the books right there. Now put in what's missing. You know that's clearly the power here, and and the and the promise is huge. So I'm clapping for you. I think you've done a terrific thing, and I feel privileged that we were able to get a glimpse of it after year one. And hopefully, we'll be able to follow your progress, and and you'll be able to use us as a community to at least through Classroom 2.0 and some of the other things that we're doing to to get the word out. So thanks for coming tonight. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. I agree. If, if anyone has any ideas, please come forward and talk to me. I love people when they approach us. Okay, thanks, everybody, for being here. Thanks, Niru, for your work and the work of those who are working with you. Again, uh, our appreciation to Illuminate, uh, to C. Bloom and Associates, who provide me with a little bit of a book budget. We've talked about that before. And then coming up tomorrow night, Graham Glass on his uh, online learning course management system, EDU 2.0. Uh, Niru, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. Sure, privilege to be uh, with you uh, talking about this uh, open source digital textbook initiative from CK12. Thanks, and good night. Thank you.